Thanks, Sherry. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm on the East Coast, so it's 1 o'clock this afternoon here. I'm not sure where everybody else is, but uh, welcome. I did see a, a, a note come through that said audio is cutting in and out, and that sometimes happens based on the bandwidth of your, uh, based on your, your internet uh, speed and bandwidth. Um, sometimes what happens is if you pause it, uh, you can press the pause button and then um, press the play button again, wait a little bit, and then press it again, it will, it will, uh, it will help out. Um, and, and that can reset it. And if you don't have a difficulty with that or if that's not working, I'm sure you just put in the chat box some information about uh, calling in if uh, the audio is really not working well for you. So uh, the, earlier today, a little bit ago, I just e sent out an updated email uh, with the handouts. So that did come through. I know some people did acknowledge that already. So you know, check your inboxes or even spam folders just to make sure that it's not there. Um, I apologize for getting them out later, uh, but I think what happens sometimes is uh, we, we send out the hand, handouts and it reminds everybody to come. So sometimes that works out in our favor. Anyway, as Sherry mentioned, I'm the head of our clinical training and consultation services. So what we're going to do today is really focus on, um, um, you know, we are, we are Pearson, right? Um, so even though we're not going to focus on specific products that Pearson has, I will, yes, mention some um, Pearson assessments and P Pearson interventions. So just to let you know ahead of time that when I get to that section, um, the stuff that you're going to hear uh, is going to be about uh, some, of the, some of the tests that we have, although I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on those. We really are going to focus on dyscalculia and, and really understanding that. I know that there's, you know, d d um, dyslexia is getting a, a lot of attention now across the country, and dyscalculia, just like math disorder versus reading disorder, you know, that whole conversation is a little lopsided sometimes. But... We see a lot of students in schools and coming to our clinical uh, clinical uh, settings that really exhibit patterns that are specific to dyscalculia, and we want to make sure that through our session today we, we, we can help you out with some of that information. Feel free to send some information through the, web, uh, through the chat box on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. I may or may not see it. Uh, there are a lot of you on the line today, so welcome and thanks for coming. And if I, but if I do see a question, I'll address it as I can. Before we get started, I'd like to see who's all in the room today. Um, you know, put a put a check mark next to what fits you best, and if other fits you, that's fine as well. All right. So, see, actually, a, a good bit of you are putting in other. If anybody is putting other in the the, che the little check box, um, do you mind throwing in the chat box on the bottom left what other it means for you? See, most folks here on the call today are going to be school psychologists, um, and, uh, several teachers, learning specialists as well. So, I'm just interested to see uh, what other um, means. Educational diagnosticians. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, thank. You. Well, actually, interesting. Wow, everybody's putting an educational diagnostician. Oh, marriage and th family therapist too. All right. So wonderful. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. You know, I put this slide up here because when we talk about things like dyscalculia and um, and really uh, any other neurodevelopmental conditions, learning uh, disorders, we have to think about how our our, our brains are working and how the the, the gears are turning, um, and and are they turning in the right right way, the right pattern? You know, it's. it's it's about pathways, and it's about the integration of multiple skills to solve a problem or to really make our output efficient. And that, I really like this picture because it makes me think of that, um, that process every time I come through uh, the discussion of a learning disorder or a neurodevelopmental conditions. I want you to just, I want you to get, you, get yourself in, in the, the framework uh, and in the mindset of what it's like to have difficulties with mathematics. I'm not sure if anybody on the call today experiences personal difficulties with mathematics, but I want you to be able to kind of put that hat on of somebody who's having difficulties and just think about what it's like to get through their day. Um, so let's say you go to the store uh, and you buy some groceries and they, they come up to $19.90 and you have a $20 bill. Uh, do, you, do you know if you have enough money to pay for that? Um, how much change should you expect? You know, how do you interact at that point? Are you pulling out a 20 plus another 10 to make sure you, you're paying enough? Um, do you over? Do you overage? Do you under? Do you uh, you know underestimate what that's going to cost? But a, that's an a interesting question. You know, how do people get past that if they're having difficulties understanding numerical concepts? Now, sometimes folks write numbers in reverse. Sometimes they're so focused on understanding or trying to focus on what a number is that 
that they are mixing them up, uh, not only in terms of uh, their location and their, their orientation, but they're out of order. So 132, 132 for 123, and that type of switching happens often. Uh, where, where are we seeing that occur? You know, do we have a complete understanding of number sense? Um, ordinality, do we know what, where they come in, in place, uh, in, in, in place next to each other? Which one's larger than the other? If I'm saying I have 132 of something, is that greater than or less than 123? And then when you look at math problems, you know, math problems can be very complex. The problem solving process, something that in, in, involves or incorporates um, not only the basic understanding of math skills, but then also something that requires you to plan and problem solve. So if you first solve a problem like in the top box here, 13, time, uh, 13 plus 15 equals 10, um, and the way that you're doing that is by adding each number separately, you, you get one number. Um, the second example is the second time you solve it, you add the, the outside numbers, um, or the first number first and the second number second, or um, maybe you are um, adding them in reverse because, quite frankly, you're not really understanding um, what process should be applied here. Um, and boy, this gets even more difficult when you switch it around, when you have um, when you switch it around to look something like this, where you have numbers on top of each other. So if you do it this way, then if you show students the number this way, um, vertically versus horizontally, um, or any adult for that matter. Are they incorporating or are they using the same process that they used before? A lot of times what we see with people with dyscalculia or math disorders in general is, uh, is a, an inconsistency with how they solve the problems. So you will see very different processes involved in how they are, uh, they are actually getting to that answer. So let's think about what is specifically dyscalculia. Let's first start with a prevalence rates. Um, you know, if you think about special education in general or many, um, many conditions, many neurodevelopmental conditions, 6% is just about, just about the average. You know, that's what we're looking at for most of them. So 6% of the population based on epidemiological studies um, show characteristics or diagnosis of dyscalculia. Um, sometimes that could be considered a little bit higher, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute when we think about some of the comorbidities that occur, um, dyslexia and dyscalculia occurring together at a high percentage, a high rate, um, and it makes sense when you really think about the neurodevelopmental aspects of each one of them. Um, anyway, dyscalculia is brain-based. Uh, we have uh, some good evidence, um, fMRI and um, neuroimaging em efforts showing us that there is um, poor communication between hemispheres, really, that highlights to us the integration of multiple skills. Uh, you know, oftentimes when we're talking about this process of learning, it's not necessarily one region of the brain, rather the, uh, it's the communication between multiple regions. So there's evidence showing that for communication. People with dyscalculia have difficulty making sense of numbers and math concepts. They oftentimes can't grasp that basic understanding of what numbers mean. What is greater than, what is less than, um, how do you apply rules to solving certain problems? And you know, children in math classes oftentimes know what to do, but they don't know why they're doing it. So yes, they can learn the process if necessary um, until they feel comfortable with it. It might, might, might be difficult to integrate that. But they can learn a process. Their memory not, isn't necessarily affected. Um, but they don't really understand why they're doing it. And, and what becomes more difficult then, even more difficult, is when you integrate, uh, you know, reading, um, uh, reading math problems into that. So when you're asking them something versus showing them and, and um, through, you know, use of equations, um, that process becomes much more complex. So um, being able to transition or transfer over the knowledge of, of understanding how to do addition and subtraction into uh, when somebody says greater than or um, more than or less than, um, how, how does that transfer over? Children with math problems and dyscalculia have significant problems with that. Um, at, at the basic level, if we kind of go back a little bit in terms of what are some of the basic foundational difficulties that people have, it's uh, a less developed mental number line. Um, and that really reduces a person's ability to understand numbers in general. So we develop a mental number line 
um, that is um, it's it, it's semi visual spatial in nature, uh, but it is it is also then mediated verbally. But if you have a if you have a mental number line formed, um, you can understand where quantities lie and the relationship between various quantities, and that's a foundational skill, right? That comes before actually learning what math processes are. It's understanding what 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 uh, what's meant by certain areas or what's meant by certain quantities. Um, and you can see that in young kids, right? So I have a young, well, I have two young kids, but one of them is five. Um, and just a couple of years ago, I would say a year, maybe two years ago, he really started to demonstrate for me the difference at three years old, the differences between quantities um, at a better at a better rate. So um, you know, we start to see that develop in young kids, really seeing, oh, there, here's a pile of something that's more than this pile over here, um, and it, it's not just because it's bigger. Um, it's because there's actually more. So that whole, ne that whole number line development um, really occurs um, and is, is less developed in kids with dyscalculia. Poor automaticity, I think that that's a, that's a really key piece there. You know, so you're having difficulty with um, understanding the concepts and understanding why you're doing something. The automaticity doesn't necessarily form. Um, and that, that could also be affected by difficulties with working memory and, and executive control. But absolutely, um, the ability to just be automatic with how, how you solve a problem um, is affected uh, for, for kids with uh, dyscalculia. And this last one I'm going to get into a little bit more, a little bit more in a second, but um, some research is showing that the brain areas that specialize in the processing of numbers are underdeveloped by about four to six years. So when we look at the differences in, in what, um, what it means to um, have automated math skills, um, in the transfer of uh, into actual number and, and, and ordinality and so forth, well, that process is about four to six years um, delayed in kids with dyscalculia. So it is important for us to think about what is an automated math skill. Uh, let's go into a little bit more detail about this. Now, you know, it's interesting because whenever we use these online platforms, there's always something that occurs that I didn't take into account when I was building the presentation. Um, these weren't supposed to pop up. I, I had animations here, but they, <laughs> the animations were removed when I put it into the program, so I apologize for that. But so in terms of automated math skills, if you look at the first one there, it's the basic level, right? So when you look at the, the, the number or the dots, um, knowing that the left is less than the right, um, even though, and this is the example I just gave with my son, um, even though there are bigger circles on the left, there are more circles on the right. So there's 24 versus 57. Um, that's an automated math skill. That's an automatic skill that starts to develop as children get to three, four, or five years of age. Uh, what is 5 plus 7? That should just come automatically. Yes, there's some of that is a rote learning process. Um, and we can improve fluency and improve this automation uh, by teaching those skills. It's the same thing like with teaching, um, although it's a slightly different neurological process, um, but it's the same thing with learning sight words so that we can improve the ability to not have to focus on what these mean. So flashcards, uh, really learning math, learning um, addition, subtraction, um, everything between 1 and 10 should just be automatic, right? Uh, multiplication as well. Um, what, you know, uh, counting backwards, et cetera, you know, being able to transfer from what, it, what, the, um, what 2 looks like, um, with symbols to the word to, to the number to, to where to um, occurs in a number line compared to five and ten, right? These are these are examples of what automated math skills are. So um, so you know these are things that people and kids with dyscalculia have significant difficulty with. This is a question that came through that says um, that was uh, um, from Christina asking. Was I saying four to six years delayed, or delays are evident in four to six-year-olds? You know, so Christina, that the data that I'm talking about is really coming from um, older folks. So the development of these math skills tends to be delayed by four to six years. So it doesn't. It's not that it, it occurs. It, it may occur. Some of those skills may start to occur in four to six-year-olds, but they then become delayed by four to six years. So imagine what that means. Um, imagine, if you will. Uh, even seeing like a third or fourth grader uh, where uh, we're expecting them to integrate some of those basic skills into more algebraic equations or uh, more complex problems, 
where um, where the basic skills are going to still be delayed. So expecting that at you know four fifth grade is going to be a significant problem. All right, let's move on to let's look at this. Let's look at this. Uh, this is a little bit of the brain research um, coming about uh, about this calculus and learning math in general. But if we look at um, you know, the development of um, our understanding magnitude, and we first start with um, two dots, uh, transfer that into uh, the idea of the, the the number or the you know the word two, the number two, and then also understanding where that is in the number line. This is a this is a, a pretty interesting um, chart that kind of shows how that stuff is developed and where that stuff becomes developed. So the parietal, parietal pre uh, left prefrontal and occipital lobes tend to be the most uh, most implicated in learning or the process of math and the development of this um, of this process, right? So if we think about um, magnitude being more of a parietal uh, activation. Um, we think about the transfer into um, hearing, um, so the phonology, the uh, phonological awareness, or the um, understanding how that is, um, and what the word is for that. <clears throat> Transferring that into then an actual uh, number and understanding where that number occurs in the number line, kind of goes through the parietal, left prefrontal, occipital loop. Um, so I kind of have that listed out here in um, in this little this little. Um, uh, figure at the bottom of the screen, this little picture at the bottom of the screen. So let's get into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, it really, they really thought about it as a four-step model. Uh, these uh, Van Aster and uh, Shalev, the these researchers really think about it as a four-step model. And if you think about it, it makes a lot, lot of sense. So the first step is the core system of magnitude, so cardinality. You know, we have concrete, uh, concrete quantities. It's a sort of a biparietal um, activation. We're looking at subsidizing, approximation, comparison at that point, and that starts to occur in babies and toddlers, a little bit more so um, developed in you know two to three year olds. By uh, by preschool, we're looking at the verbal number system, so knowing one, two, three, four, understanding the counting, being able to sing counting words and stuff like that, counting songs. Um, really, as a left prefrontal activation, requiring counting, counting strategies and facts. And once you move into school, then you start to transfer and understand the Arabic, uh, Arabic number system and then the mental number line. Um, and it really moves from a, an occipital to then more of a parietal um, process. If you think about it, um, understanding the number system then requires some visual spatial um, processes that then would be um, processed uh, with regard to understanding of previously learned knowledge to understand that number line. So. If you think about this process in, in a little more detail, um, the, the the prefrontal activation comes in when the the verbal number system starts to happen. But if if we know what the frontal system tends to do, is it tends to become involved when novel things are are, are novel processes are being learned. When something is novel, we tend to activate uh, frontal lobes more so. So the reliance on frontal lobe really occurs at an earlier age. As the as the uh, the skills become more um, ingrained and less novel, uh, the frontal activation occurs much is much less required. Um, so and that's pretty much seen in this in this step. I think this step, these four step this four step model really it does um, highlight the hierarchical hierarchical development pretty well. And here's another example of that. So if we think about the brain development at the top, it's a typical picture in children where you see much more frontal activation. Um, let's see if I can change the color of this to show the really highlight better. So we can see much more frontal activation than we do in other um, in adults. So this bottom one is an adult. Uh, these are adults, right? And we see much less uh, frontal activation and much uh, stronger bridal activation. And that makes sense when we think about how. Um, how the, the transition occurs. So once it becomes less novel, once it becomes more automatic, um, we're, we're less having to think about it or act actively process it in our brains. And really, it, you know, if you want to think on a basic level, the frontal lobes are going to be more about the activation. Um, so if you think about the top also, we do have, a, I do have that note up there that it's a higher strain of working memory and attention. Of course it is. If it's something that we don't know and is not ingrained, it's going to take us much more effort 
and uh, dyscalculics discalcul- or people with dyscalculia do show much more of the non-automatized patterns that you see up at the top. And again, it's, it's delayed by about four to six years. So really, I think that you know, this, this evidence uh, really gives me a better picture when I process this as to why um, the automaticity um, is, is so delayed and why that then leads to difficulties with other math later on. It's the same thing with any learning. If we're not getting the basics of foundation and the foundational skills necessary, you know, those more complex math problems are going to be much more difficult later on. And, you know, I always come back to this, what is the life functioning that can be effective? I showed you a couple examples earlier on, uh, but it's, it's important for us to always come back to the idea and understanding of what areas are we going to see most affected with um, people with dyscalculia. And, you know, difficulty with functioning in daily life skills. So, again, paying bills, like I said earlier, and getting correct change, like I said earlier, that's a real problem. Um, people with dyscalculia tend to earn and spend less money. Um, they tend to fall ill more often, um, more conflict with the law, need more assistance at school, and maybe more anxious than others. And we'll get into that more in a minute, the anxiety piece of it. Um, but, you know, we, we see this pattern in other learning, um, learning disorder patterns as well, or learning disorder profiles as well. Um, but it makes a lot of sense when folks have a significant difficulty with math. They, they, they are affected across very, um, various life stages and various life um, areas, life functional areas. I want to ask you all, if you're in a school setting, and I think most of you are, I think there may be a couple of you that are not, but if you're in a school setting, is this calculia openly discussed in your setting? And what I mean by that is if you're having a, if you're having a case come through, um, does anybody ever bring this up? Wow, that's a, that's a pretty big split. If I'm, I'm, uh, I will tell you that I'm surprised that it's brought up in, in as many cases as it is. It's about a, it's about a quarter to uh, three quarter split here. Um, but I'm surprised, and that's just great. But I think I think the reason we ask this question is just to really highlight how many um, um, areas across the country are not discussing it or do not discuss this calculator um, at all. All right, let's see, um, let's move on. Okay, so that makes us kind of come back then and think about how we define math learning disabilities. And, and this, this same process comes up when I'm asked about dyslexia. Um, and dyscalculia is another one. Uh, it's, uh, um, dysgraphia is going to be another one, I mean. Um, but, you know, the same process is going to come up, or same considerations. How do we define disabilities in schools? Well, it is, of course, we all know, it's very different from how we define um, psychiatric conditions in clinical um, world or neuropsychological conditions in the other clinical world. But really, really, the process is, is the same. Um, I think we sometimes, not sometimes, most oftentimes, we get hung up by terminology in the law um, and what's required of us. But essentially, we're talking about the same things. Um, under, under IDEA, really what they're talking about is, is a disorder that is caused by something that then leads to a difficulty in learning, right? So if you really break that down, what is this calculia other than that condition? Um, I, I feel like uh, sometimes we get hung up on the terms, um, and a person with dyscalculia, if they have difficulty with math in school, should qualify for special education services, whether it be an IEP, whether, whether it be a, a, a um, um, classification as a student with a learning disability or whether it be as a 504 plan, they still fit the category. Uh, it's about having a condition and then ex- uh, you know, having that condition show itself in some way that affects their learning. So dyscalculia really is that medical or clinical term for, for the condition that we oftentimes are called on to identify in, in schools. So whether or not you use the term dys- dyscalculia uh, is really not the point. It's, the point is understanding the underlying deficits, what they are, and then identifying that to get the child services. Now, I, you know, I don't see anything um, in the law. Uh, I've never seen anything in the law or regulations that say the use of those terms um, is for- prohibited. Um, I, there's nothing that says it's prohibited. You just have to be careful because if we're identifying these things, 
um, need to make sure that's not a diagnosis of dyscalculia in schools, but rather an identification of dyscalculia patterns um, and, and probabilities, but then also certifying that we're, we're really seeing that impact in learning. And, and you know, it's not oftentimes used in American public schools, but it is very often used in other um, regions of the world. So, for example, in Europe. Um, in Europe, you will see dyscalculia used in schools quite frequently. Um, so, you know, school systems are addressing this. Um, again, you have to think about what is dyscalculia versus SLD in math. And again, it's really about the diagnosis of neurobiological conditions versus educational condition. Uh, and yes, there's overlap, and there should be. Um, it, it can qualify a student for student uh, for a 504 plan. And as I said earlier, uh, I really do believe that whether or not it's identified in school or medically, it most often, if a child has dyscalculia, they will qualify for special education services of some type, because it's unlikely uh, that their dyscalculia is not going to show up in um, uh, learning troubles at school. That's very unlikely. So we really have to document that impact on classroom and educational performance. So I did. I see a question that came through. Hopefully, I answered it. What's the difference between re, uh, referring to it as dyscalculia and SLD in math in schools? And it's really about who, where you're defining it, uh, because dyscalculia is the condition, as I said earlier, and SLD in math in schools is really the condition plus the impact on learning. So it's really about who's defining it and where you're defining it. But um, in essence, there is there is um, there is a, um, some case for uh, them being the same, if not very similar. Um, in terms of learning. But I think the same process is the conversation I have with uh, dys dyslexia, which is that um, everybody who has dyslexia uh, will qualify or has a learning disability in reading. Um, however, not everybody who has a learning disability in reading will have dyslexia. It's the same thing with dyscalculia. Um, dyscalculia will, uh, is, you know, is necessary. Um, you know, People with dyscalculia will have a learning disability in math, but not everybody with a learning disability in math will have dyscalculia. So I think it's an important distinction to make. There are significant challenges in schools, and I think that you guys, you guys can all um, agree to this, that helping children with th these types of difficulties can be very difficult um, because of the materials, um, the time and professionals, and really no means to train students independently. So the ability for us to address those foundational math skills becomes much more difficult. What do we do? Oftentimes we send home uh, worksheets on you know, working on math, um, but are we really getting at those core difficulties that I mentioned earlier, that automatic learning process, those foundational skills, um, under, uh, you know, transferring um, um, amounts, um, visual amounts into verbal, verbal numbers, into um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So are, are we doing that? It's very difficult for us to do. Um, practice does make perfect with math. We know that math skills being automated can be improved with practice. So, you know, regular tra training can be hard to organize, and it has to be the right training. Um, so you don't just give kids a, you know, a, a, a math worksheet and just have them practice over and over again if it's not addressing their key issues. It's very important that they practice over and over again. Um, my, uh, you know, my daughter can't say when I say that. You have to practice math every day. She doesn't, <laughs> just bothers her. Um, but I keep telling her that the practice of math, specifically, there's a lot of research that shows that the practice of math is, is really important, kind of like being a piano artist or math uh, or any other musician for that matter. Let's talk about related conditions. Um, so math anxiety is a real big one um, in terms of becoming worried about math. So children may become so worried that doing math uh, for, about their doing math that they fear and become nervous and then lead to poor performance on math tests. Math can be um, overwhelming to some people who have difficulty with math. So it's really about the anxiety in that situation leading to math performance problems, not typically understanding problems. So that's sort of the rule out there. That's the differentiation that I want you to, to make is that, uh, you know, if it's specifically math anxiety, those understanding problems are not there. It's typically performance problems. So it gets much more complicated when you have a child who has math anxiety and dyscalculia um, because the poor performance and underlying disability in, it occurs in the presence of increased expectations. And that often leads to academic-related emotional conditions such as anxiety. So 
it, it gets much more complicated. So in this differentiation process, you have to determine what came first or what is leading to what. Um, and I think a lot of times the best way to do that is to really key in on that understanding problem. Are they understanding why they have to do something math? They might not be great at it, but do they have that understanding? Um, and, and then you can really start to tease out and parse out whether or not it's anxiety that's just leading to overall performance deficits. Um, you know, anxiety absolutely also inhibits neurotransmission um, and uh, the ability for the brain to be, uh, to be effective. So it, it does re reduce the overall capacity for learning. So we know how much anxiety can affect somebody's learning. So this is a related condition. Related can be co-occurring, but most of the time is not. Um, however, you know, if somebody is aware of dyscalculia and they know that their mass uh, really is such an effect over time, it's likely that they will become anxious about it over time as well. So just that's something we need to be very, very careful with in schools. The next one is dyslexia. I did bring this up uh, a, little bit, a little bit ago, but I think the, the reason why this is so important for us to consider is that they're both neurobiological in origin. Um, and whenever you have conditions that are neurobiological, it's, it's likely that they co-occur, or it is not uncommon that they co-occur. And the numbers are, are, are pretty high. And if you look at the numbers that I have here up on the screen, 43 to 65% of children with math also have reading difficulties. Math difficulties also have reading disabilities. So, uh, you know, the, the, that co-occurrence is, is really high, um, and we have to consider that. We have to consider the, the, the brain pathways that are involved in both um, and how they tend to co-occur. And ADHD. Um, it's interesting how ADHD sort of crosses various learning areas. It's, it's not considered a learning disability necessarily, but it is a learning disability. If somebody has difficulty with regulating um, cognitive impulse control or uh, behavioral control and uh, attention, for example, um, the, the intake or the input and also the process and output of cognition is significantly affected. So if we have somebody with, um, with ADHD, oftentimes what we see with math difficulties are impulse control, so impulse discontrol and inattention. With the math problems, um, they, uh, they tend to explain errors better than dyscalculia does. So for example, you'll see um, kids with ADHD have um, sign errors a lot. So, uh, you know, they'll go through and they'll add when they should be subtracting. They'll go multiply when they should be adding. Um, they'll have a lot of those types of errors. They'll have a lot of types of errors where um, just uh, they'll, they'll move through problems very quickly and, and, um, and miss basic addition um, just because they're not paying attention. They don't go back and self-check or self-correct. So those types of errors that we're seeing um, are the best way to differentiate between whether or not ADHD is the, is the key issue or not. Uh, it's really the error patterns that we tend to see over time with them. Um, and, and really, I think that last point is important, but the best practice for this is to evaluate math after the ADHD symptoms are controlled. If you can control those um, either via um, medical intervention or via uh, you know, some accommodations um, for children to be able to control um, their, their inattention you know, and their impulse of uh, responding, then that, that tends to be the best way to evaluate that, but you will see it in the error patterns. So let's look at this case study. She's a fourth grader named Abby. Um, could be any fourth grader named uh, whatever you want it to be. Um, uh, but this is a case study. I just want to kind of go through it just to see how, how, uh, how this sort of applies from beginning to end. And this tends to be an area. This is a common, you know, uh, when I was uh, practicing in schools, this was, this was a common um, profile um, where we'd see kids with really great skills in other areas and uh, have some significant math problems. So let's, let's go over this, uh, this case and see, see what we can, we can parse out. If we think about Tier 1, though, so let's just imagine that this youngster is in a school system that, that follows a pretty structured tier, uh, tiered process, RTI process. So at Tier 1, you know, we're, we're looking to conduct that universal screening for everybody to try to determine where everybody is. And, and just remember, this is a fourth grader, so she's probably gone through some of this um, over and over again throughout school. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you sit back and really analyze what that means, it means that from, from kindergarten through third grade, um, much less not, probably kindergarten through second grade, 
not necessarily third grade, but kindergarten through second grade, you really are working on a lot of more basic math problems, right? So um, we see that um, we see that around third, you know, third to fourth grade is when the more complex math starts to occur, um, and and we were we're going to start to expect more significant difficulties at that point. Um, so, you know, this is a typical RTI process, right? We're going to start to universal screen. We're going to evaluate our instruction. We're going to try to see uh, if we can put into place some research-based interventions and so forth, and see how we can we can impact the student. You know, in terms of what you should screen for for math, you should really be looking at those early numeracy uh, areas. The math computation and math concepts should be screened as well. Um, it's tough to screen more detailed levels than this. These are going to be mostly performance-based measures, right? We're not going to uh, we don't have any really well-developed math um, dyscalculia um, um, rating forms yet, um, but this is, these are going to be things that we, we tend to screen for in performance assessments. But you have to keep in mind that screeners have a limitation, and every screener has a limitation. Um, screeners are not meant to diagnose. They're not meant to um, identify the degree of impairment or how much somebody, a child is impaired. It's really just looking at how much, or if they're at, at risk for further difficulties down the road. Um, so we have to be able to take that with, uh, uh, with caution. Um, we can't look at patterns of strengths and weaknesses at the screener level. And really that, that fourth point there, the fourth bullet there, is that uh, you, know, you do have the ability or you have the potential, not the potential, you have, or not the ability, you have the potential to identify a higher number of students at this level. And that really depends on how, this, how the screeners are, are developed, uh, what the prevalence data is for um, for the specific condition, um, you can limit it by what I call smart screening, and that really looks at um, using a multi-step screening process. Um, you can really limit the ability to do that or, or to identify higher students. So, uh, but that's these are all conditions or these are all components that we have to be very careful with. Uh, really, the the idea of a screener is to figure out what you're trying to answer, and so how many or what level you're trying to identify kids and pick the screener that really focuses on those the best. And at this point, though, you have to think about what to do with the kids who are at risk. So screeners only give us a certain amount of data. Uh, like what do we do beyond screeners? Um, I think universal screening is great, uh, but it only is great if we apply some great process after that. Um, if we do something for those students, if we make sure that we are addressing them um, in an effective way, and at the same time collecting that additional body of evidence um, to make sure that students are genu genuinely at risk. And that sort of is that smart screening process I talked about earlier. So look at, um, um, you know, looking at what they're doing on the screener, looking at other bodies of evidence to really, to really validate that risk. Um, uh, oh, does a student have underlying attendance, home language, or behavioral concerns that can be impacting their academics, you know, all that kind of stuff. If all this stuff checks out, you really should move on to Tier 2. But a lot of times in Tier 1, we will go a little bit more in detail depending on what levels or what types of screening we're implementing. But for this case, for Abby's case, let's just talk about um, the universal screening application in AIMSWeb for math. And um, what, what for this case we are, we're using is the MCOMP and the MCAP. So math computation, math concepts, and applications. And hopefully uh, this looks very familiar to everybody, but in fourth grade when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at what this child is, is, is performing, um, she's having a real significant difficulty over time from September through November. And if we look at, I know that this is very hard to see, and I don't even, to be honest with you, I, just, I brought this up for an example. Her score would be 59 and the target at 77. We see that there's a pretty significant um, drop off. She's in the she's in the bottom 20 percent, 20 percent. So we then really are seeing evidence here that she's having a significant difficulty over time. Now, even though she's a fourth grader, she's had difficulty over time. She's a smart kid, so that stuff has been masked. These are the ones that you have to be very careful with. Are the kids that can mask those difficulties over time? So after we find that data coming through in that screening process, we should really start to see a big red light going off. And we should start asking ourselves, who is Abby? Because now, now we're starting to see some real, some real difficulties, um, and we have, to, we have to identify what's causing that. But she's a 10-year-old student in the Southeast US. Um, she is the daughter of an artist and chemical engineer. Interestingly enough, her dad's the artist, and her mom's a chemical, chemical engineer. 
Her family history is academically very strong, as you could imagine, some admitted math weaknesses on the paternal side. Um, it, you know, nothing really that throws up a red flag when it comes to learning or cognitive disabilities, though. So it's something we have to be uh, very aware of. So again, this is a child who's sort of masking weaknesses over time. Uh, as I said, because of her higher than average ability, uh, she's been successful um, except for really math application and acquisition. Um, she frequently fails her fourth grade math tests. Um, homework is a constant struggle at home. Uh, it's not only tough, but she's now starting to be anxious every time the subject the subject is addressed. I mean, we know those children. You know, you you say, okay, okay, homework's homework time, and then you pull out the math problems, and they really have a hard time with that. Or you know, like same way with other kids when you pull out reading. So she was really having a lot of anxiety at that point. Um, she did su attend some summer math tutoring in second and third grade. I mean. Even though it wasn't a, a um, significant weakness at that point, they really just started to think, let's start getting her, her in tutoring programs. And when you have two high-functioning parents who really want their students or who really want their children to succeed, that, that's oftentimes um, not uncommon. But again, we have below the 20th percentile on both the MCAP and MCOMP, which are the two um, screeners I showed you before. So really we have to think, how can we help Abby's school help her learn? Really, how are we helping? the school help her learn. So we need to make sure that we can engage um, her strengths and weaknesses uh, effectively. So in terms of tier one intervention for this youngster, um, she works in a small group for about 10 minutes a day and she re reviews the lessons. Um, she's encouraged to ask questions at this point, um, but her performance is erratic. Um, she may know the concept one day and may not know it the next day. So this is what's occurring for us right now in trial uh, in Tier 1. When we move to Trial 2, moving on to something different, um, she, uh, she goes to after-school tutoring twice weekly for 30 minutes a week. Um, her tutor will help her complete assignments and um, will do progress monitoring weekly, really evaluating her progress over time. Due to some slow progress that she was having and lack of response at this time to the tutoring, and she really wasn't doing very well with the tutoring, it was increased to three times a week uh, per session because, and 30 minutes per session because she really wasn't showing any benefit to that, to that two times a week. So we just increased the intensity, uh, increased the frequency, I'm sorry, um, and just continue to evaluate progress at that time. Here are some artifacts that I think are important for us to, to break down. Right? So for a kid like this, we should start to look at what else are we seeing? How are we seeing her... Um, her solve problems. So what errors are being made here? Uh, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. What do you guys see in this slide uh, that, that sort of comes out to you? What are you, start, what are you starting to see in, in her classroom and screening artifacts? Okay, not, not, not paying attention to function, misreading signs, operation errors, operational errors, place value errors, a lot of people putting in information, um, error in process, wrong order, exactly. She doesn't understand regrouping, exactly. So yeah, you're seeing a lot of these errors um, in just classroom artifacts. So to me, it starts to get me to think, you know, is she understanding the process? Does she understand what math process to use? And, I, and we're seeing some evidence here that she knows she does not. With the observation and interview information that we're gathering, she, you know, when we did an observation of her, um, she appeared to be engaged in her lesson, but she doesn't volunteer. So of course she's not going to she's not going to uh, you know call out answers or raise her hand to give answers. Um, in a five problem um, assignment, which was about ten minutes, she didn't complete any of those problems. So all of her all of her co um, classmates did. Um, she didn't complete any of them in ten minutes. She wasn't impulsive, but she was limited by the number of alternative strategies she used. She did rely on verbal rehearsal to recall information. Um, so she would, you could see her speaking to herself using the inner voice to be able to rehearse uh, more, than, more so than the other kids. And she was unable to explain her reasoning for strategies, even when her responses were correct. So um, aside from that assignment of math, five math problems, when she was doing math problems, she may get it right once and not another time and then not be able to tell me why that was the case. So w why did you do it this time. Um, how did you get the correct answer here, Abby? Um, I, she, and she didn't know. So let's think about where to go next. Uh, in terms of additional assessments, every academic concern needs more information. 
<laughs> to, to better plan a way to fix it. That, that, additional, that initial information is good. It just doesn't give us enough to understand. Her, her, her profile here is a little bit complex. Um, it's not simply a difficulty with, um, with what we wrote down before, the question I just asked you. It's not, it's not simply an operational error. She was exhibiting operational error. She was having a difficult time understanding how to process or what, what process to use when doing the math problems. But that's not, what it, that's not what's causing her difficulty. That, that's, that's, a, that's more or less a symptom. That's the, uh, that's the runny nose. Right? That's the cough. Well, we need to figure out what is causing her to have difficulty. So we need to really break the, her academics down a little bit more. So for a math difficulty, we have to think about is it computation? Is it problem solving? Is it concepts? You know, et cetera. We have to really break it down to think where are these difficulties occurring? Um, really bringing ourselves into some more questions about Tier 2, some more questions about assessment. Uh, why has she not shown adequate progress to so those interventions you put into place? Um, how do we make them more effective? Um, does she have specific needs and strengths that can focus uh, uh, that can uh, the, that can focus to improve that we can focus on to improve her skill acquisition? So we really have to focus on on those those key questions. So for this part of the assessment process, I gave her the TMAP three diagnostic assessment, and these are the scores that came out. Our basic concepts were 79, operations was 78, applications was 83, and the total composite was 79. So we see some pretty significant weaknesses across the board. Um, applications being at 83, not a surprise to me, given that you probably didn't have to get that many correct to get an 83. Um, but overall, to me, a process like this really starts to get me thinking, what um, basic level skills is she missing? Um, and, and even though I know that this is a, a very, very capable young, young woman and has um, a very high cognitive ability overall, I believe, um, she's still performing at such a low level compared to her peers. So w what do you think when you get to this point? Um, do you feel confident in recommending strategies for students with math weaknesses? I mean, once you get to this point, what would you uh, – you don't need to put them in the chat box, but what do you believe you would um, recommend for her? Um, you know, I, don't, I, I, I know myself, I always have a difficult time at this level at this level, um, suggesting really key interventions. Not that I can't suggest interventions that will be helpful, but just at this level I feel like I'm missing some data still, um, especially with a profile like this, because this profile can be very complicated. Um, and, I, and I just feel like I don't want to, uh, to miss it. Right? So let's move on to the idea of intervention and what we would do for this youngster. So, Again, this, is, this goes back, I had this earlier, but there are challenges for us in schools to help students with math difficulties. So I wanted to reiterate that on this slide, but it really is the, the difficulty in implementing a program at the school level for us to be successful with um, mathematics learning. There's, a, there's a, an intervention program called Calcularis um, that is a, mathematic, it's a, it's a mathematical learning software and it's something that can be applied at the home and school uh, levels. And what it does at this point, this is, a, this is an example, one example of an intervention that can assist in learning the essential, um, the essential building blocks of mathematics and essentially assist the brain in that maturation process. So if you think about any, um, you know, I don't know if you've all done any research on, um, on um, automated or computer-based assessment uh, learning strategies or, or intervention strategies, the, the, the good ones that have good research in the, um, done with them at the same time that they're developed will show a pattern of brain maturation from time one to time two, essentially showing that uh, processes that may, may not have been efficient um, before the intervention will show efficiency later on. So that's what a program like Calcularis or Cognet, working with working memory, or uh, other, other computer-based programs tend to do, is they tend to work on foundational skills to improve the brain's process over time. So essentially what this intervention does is it combines neuroscience and um, computer science into, into one to be able to identify what weaknesses kids have. And if you can see here in terms of the skills, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Again, this is just an intervention I wanted to bring up. Um, if you go into the skills, look at the skills that we're measuring and then going uh, and working on kids, um, subsidizing, estimating, Comprehension of numbers, working from verbal, uh, Arabic, Arabic, how do you mispronounce that? Analog, 
uh, conversion of verbal to Arabic to analog, number line, what's bigger, what's smaller, intervals, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and oftentimes what's, what holds us up in schools is we say, for a fourth grader, should I be working on number line? Well, that's where the idea of understanding dyscalculia could be very beneficial for your program. Because if you have a student with dyscalculia, you may have to start back here. Because if these foundational skills are not worked on, are not addressed, the ability for them to establish and develop uh, more complex math um, skills later on is going to be much, lim much more limited than you would if you just put into place general intervention. So that's why I think this overall conversation we're having today about this calculus is so important. But sometimes we do have to go back to square one to be able to implement these basic levels of interventions. And a, you know, a program like uh, Calcularis um, can, can do that. It goes back and actually teaches that. And here's an example of some of the outcomes. Right? And this is, this is sort of my last slide on this, but um, really showing the differences between um, addition of subtraction skills from time one to time two after after six weeks and then after 12 weeks of learning the improvements in those skills. So my, my um, recommendation is to combine something like that with teaching recommendations that are, are effective. Um, you know, we can make, we, we oftentimes miss one or the other. Um, so combining two very important or uh, very structured intervention methods can be, can be beneficial in cases like Abby's. Um, so improving automaticity. There are some really great um, suggestions for improving aut automaticity. And again, these are going to be handouts, so I'm going to go over them quickly, but you can look at them at your leisure. Um, working on executive um, working memory, so working on dually encoding. Um, how, how well does somebody do that? Putting into place strategies to make that more efficient. Um, working on organizational strategies. So if you think about these, these, these last three slides I have, and let me go back real quick. Improving automaticity, um, improving a uh, person's ability to dually encode, and then working on organizational strategies, those are going to be skills that will make other processes e easier. So really what we're doing is we're trying to give them the hurdle help to be able to get past some of these in a more efficient manner. So in incorporating more executive functioning and working memory um, interventions along with that basic um, math skill intervention can be very beneficial for kids like Abby. But I, I do want to go further down this, this, this rabbit hole. Um, I think the diagnostic testing rabbit hole really does, does require us to go a little bit more in, in depth here. And it's the rule in, rule out, and learning pattern question. Right? We have to rule in and rule out stuff and then figure out the learning pattern. Now, if we implement something like Calcularis and we implement those teaching, executive teaching strategies that I just talked about early enough, it's likely that kids will continue to function well their school programs. That's, that happens. Um, it doesn't mean that they, uh, they have grown out of the weaknesses. It's just that they've found ways to, to overcome them enough to function well. You know, but this understanding of, 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 of the faculty does need to, in many cases, go further down the rabbit hole so that we can figure it out. In many cases, you're going you're gonna to need to go further down to figure it out. So what we see for, for Abby is uh, math problem solving at 76 on the Y at 3. And numerical operations at 79, math fluency at 68. Um, the math fluency at this point is something that I'm not necessarily concerned with. Uh, I expect to see fluency problems. Um, so yeah, at the second percentile there, um, of course I'm going to expect to see that. And it could also be because she's over, overwhelmed and overloaded. So you know, if she does have any difficulties with executive functioning, um, executive control, working memory, the fluency is going to be impacted anyway. Um, so that's it's something that I absolutely expect. But we see additional information here really identifying for us weaknesses overall. If I look at the numerical operations test um, uh, on the Y at 3, you can see some of the errors that she's making here. So again, look at the errors. You can put them in the chat box or not put them in the chat box. But in comparison to the discussion that we had earlier, what errors are you seeing? You're seeing these same types of error patterns. You're seeing really a misunderstanding of how to, comp how to compute them, a misunderstanding of the basic processes. And at this point, when you ask Abby what, uh, what it is that she's doing, she's really unable to tell you. Um, she's really unable to tell you why she's doing one versus another. So to go further down the rabbit hole, we need to figure out uh, a diagnostic um, profile. 
So in this situation, we can apply the pattern strengths and weaknesses analysis by using a concordance and discordance model. So essentially what we're doing here is looking at a processing strength and achievement weakness, and then also a processing strength and processing weakness. And we find some consistency, some significant consistencies and inconsistencies in this model. So identifying for us that math is an area uh, that we have a lot of um, evidence to support uh, math disability for her. So we, ha we see here in the first, first, uh, first row we have uh, her VCI was a 114. Um, her numerical operation subtest is a 79 with a difference of 35 points. Uh, the critical value at 0.05 is 8.2, so it is significantly different. Um, and it does support an SLD hypothesis. And if we look at, at row B, you can see that the processing strength of 114 um, and verbal comprehension and her processing weakness of, of 80 in working memory with a 34 point difference, of course, is a critical value uh, and does also support a, a, a SLD hypothesis. So if you see here in this process, I really, you know, it's, it, it does absolutely support at a school level, us moving down the, uh, the um, special ed pathway for specific learning disability in math. But you also saw a pattern of dyscalculia. And that's, again, as I mentioned earlier, very important. And just keep going back to the fact that that understanding of dyscalculia and understanding if a child has that or not, or exhibits patterns of that or not, really should drive your interventions, should drive what types and at what level you're intervening. Because you have to start going back to those key foundational um, issues, key foundational skills that you wouldn't even think about. You know, don't go back to just giving math, giving addition and subtraction problems. You know, yeah, that's going to be necessary, but we're, we need, may need to go back further. Helping a kid understand number sense, uh, um, um, looking at a number line and figuring out, you know, establishing that mental number line, et cetera, all those types of, it, types of issues. So for her, you know, we know that she has real strengths in verbal, uh, verbal fluid reasoning, lexical and semantic knowledge or expression are all very strong for her. Again, she has real difficulty with math-related processing deficits and specific math uh, skill deficits. She is exhibiting anxiety in math around math performance. So as we all know, kids who have that anxiety, it will get worse over time. So it's very important that we, um, we, we, we be careful with that. And error patterns. She has both uh, she has large amounts of both math back and algorithm errors. So I think to me it's pretty clear what these issues are. Um, I, and I think at school level, all of us on, on the call today will, will would support um, support the at least the intervention process that I that I laid out here, maybe in a different pattern, a different way, different methodology, but um, really focusing on those key foundational skills first. Um, so we're at the end of our time here. Let me see if I have any questions that I can answer in the last minute or so. Uh, boy, there's a lot that came through, and I apologize if I can't get to all of them. Um, let's see here. Oh, that PS PSW chart that I, I just got a question about, that PSW chart, that is, um, I believe, okay, so yes, it is. So if you do the score, uh, the score report from like QGlobal, for example, which is a Pearson uh, website, if you do the score, scoring and reporting on that, um, if, you, if you select PSW analysis from the chart, it, it will spit something like that out. Um, so I, that's where I got the screenshot from. Um, okay, so um, let's see here. Oh, I had a question about how was I able to give a standardized assessment in Tier 2? That's really about your process. I'm not sure if everybody's process was the same. But sometimes Tier 2 requires an uh, additional level of knowledge and standardized assessment can fit that. Um, again, I wouldn't give the entire battery, but the key math, it, you know, is something that helps me understand a child's uh, math. It breaks math down pretty well. So I can actually give subtests from that and contribute to Tier 2 at that point. Um, again, other schools don't do it that way. Um, I think it's effective to do it that way. I absolutely will incorporate um, standardized assessments at Tier 2, but not, not always. Not always. It's a good question. But anyway, we're at our time, folks. That was an hour. Boy, that hour went by fast. Hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed my talk today. And um, feel free to shoot us any feedback. Um, here is the website for the U.S. and Canada. I don't know if anybody from, uh, from up north is on our call today. Uh, my email if you have any questions. I do have the, the website here for Calcularis. If anybody had any questions about that, that's the intervention I talked about earlier. And you can feel free to look at that as well. 
Otherwise, have a great day, and uh, hope to talk to you all again soon.